Hello, my name is Helen Melody and I'm Lead Curator of Contemporary Literary and Creative Archives at the British Library. I'm glad you can join us for this special conversation about Ted Hughes and the theatre. Soon you'll be meeting our guest speakers, the directors Jonathan Kent, Tim Supple and David Facker, as they speak to Melvin Bragg about their experiences of working with Ted Hughes on a number of different theatrical projects during the 1980s and 90s. Ted Hughes would have been 90 last year, and to mark the occasion, the Library's Treasures Gallery is currently home to a small display on Hughes and Theatre, which runs until late October. Ted Hughes was a writer, poet and poet laureate whose work covered a wide range of subjects. The natural world is a particular focus, as in his first poetry collection, Hawk in the Rain, and The Iron Man, one of his books for children. Hughes's archive was acquired by the Library in 2008. It's a wonderful resource for anyone interested in his work and is especially strong on the poetry collection Birthday Letters. A range of items from the archive have been digitised and can be found along with contextual essays on the Discovering Literature 20th Century website. Although Hughes wrote for the theatre throughout his career, the 1990s was a particularly productive period as he produced new versions of classical and European plays, which gave his remarkable use of language yet another outlet. We're delighted to focus on this lesser known aspect of Hughes's work today, following advice from Carol Hughes. It goes without saying that the Library is very grateful to Carol for her guidance and assistance with this event. Today I'm delighted to be joined by a group of acclaimed theatre directors who commissioned some of these plays and got to know Ted well. Jonathan Kent was Joint Artistic Director of the Almeida Theatre from 1990 to 2002, during which time he commissioned and directed Ted Hughes' adaptation of Fedra, starring Diana Rigg, which went on to appear on New York's Broadway. He's directed theatre and opera around the world, from the Royal Opera House in Glyndebourne to Santa Fe Opera, working along the way with the likes of Ralph Fiennes, Juliette Binoche, Kate Blanchett and Liam Neeson. Tim Supple has directed and adapted work all over the world, literally on every continent, and has regularly worked on productions for the National Theatre and the Royal Shakespeare Company. He was artistic director of the Young Vic from 1993 to 2000, where in 1995, he commissioned and directed Ted Hughes' adaptation of Spring Awakening. They went on to work together on an adaptation of Lorca's Blood Wedding and Supple directed a theatrical version of Hughes' Tales from Ovid in 1999. David Facker is an award-winning British theatre and television director. David has been artistic director of the Duke's Playhouse, director of The Young Vic, director in residence at the Royal Shakespeare Company and artistic director of the Octagon Theatre Bolton. He also became the first professor of theatre at the University of Bolton. In 1993, he co-adapted The Iron Man into a musical with Pete Townsend before directing its successful run at the Young Vic. Today's conversation is hosted by broadcaster and author Melvin Bragg, who will be well known to you from his many programmes on television and radio, from The South Bank Show to In Our Time. He's the recipient of the BAFTA Academy Fellowship Award and the Royal Television Society's Lifetime Achievement Award and is a patron of the Ted Hughes Society. We're very grateful to all of our speakers for joining us for what promises to be a fascinating and revealing event. I'll now hand over to Melvin to open up the conversation. OK, we're talking about a very great poet who, particularly in the 1990s, turned his attention to drama. He'd worked on drama before with Peter Brook, but these 1990s, this decade, produced some extraordinary work. And these three, <laughs> three, three persons here know more about it than probably anybody else. But we want to anchor this discussion in what he was writing at the beginning of the 90s, which is this massive book, took him two years, on Shakespeare and the Goddess. Would you like to? Well, only begin by saying that it probably would take us two years to be able to do it justice in discussing it because it's incredibly dense and beautiful and insightful and um, as I think could only be written by a truly great poet in much the way I think that Coleridge had an understanding of Shakespeare. But what drive is this, does that book give to this discussion? Well, his commitment to Shakespeare, that any great poet who loves Shakespeare so much is be bound to, in some way, want to, at some point in their life, 
explore the possibility of themselves as a dramatist. I, mean, um, I guess, um, I have to say, I never spoke to Ted about that, but I do know how enthusiastic he was about productions of Shakespeare and he'd seen at least one that I directed. And so I just know it was his passion for Shakespeare, I would suggest, that led him to this. But Yeah, we know that when he went to, up to Cambridge, he, first thing in the morning he would read a Shakespeare play before doing anything else. He, I think he used a phrase like, that put me ahead, or whatever he did. <laughs> <laughs> what, can you just talk about that Shakespeare thing, as if, we, if we're using this as an anchor for this? What, what does that give us in our understanding of him? Well, I, I think, I think that his relationship, Ted's relationship with Shakespeare absolutely anchored his sense of theatre and his sense of drama and everything else he did in terms of drama sort of relates to that uh, central electric force. I just want to quote a fantastic sentence that he wrote about Ovid, which I think illustrates this. A more crucial connection maybe can be found in their common taste, that's Shakespeare and Ovid, their common taste for a tortured subjectivity and catastrophic extremes of passion that border on the grotesque. And then the second thing, which he also said in relation to Ovid and Shakespeare, which for me defined my, what, il, what was illuminated for me in reading that, that, that extraordinary book, is he talks about the act of metamorphosis, which at some point touches each of the tales, that's the Ovid tales, operates as the symbolic guarantee that the passion has become mythic, has achieved the unendurable intensity that lifts the whole episode onto the supernatural or divine plane. So in the book, he has this idea of the, the different planes of, of, of reality and the supernatural and then the pit. And it was that idea that defined my understanding of drama from the book and I think drove him into theatre. Do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, except the two things that I, I first of all asked him to do, Medea, um, and then he did further in the end. And they both, what you were saying about the extremes, about the, about the, 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 the numinous and the, and the depths were, were things which he could encompass and which he understood. And the, and the, the feral nature of, of humanity, the feral savage nature of humanity, um, all of which I think he, 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 derived a lot from Shakespeare. So let's talk, stick to the 90s and let's begin here with the Iron Man. Uh, how did that come into the record? Well, like many things, totally by accident, and um, I'm sure all of us have the same experience in our lives, that a sad thing happens and then that leads to a happy thing. <laughs> and yeah. uh, if you're lucky, we hope so. Um, I um, approached um, Pete Townsend as I was director of the Young Vic at the time, and I approached uh, Pete Townsend about the possibility of doing Tommy at the theatre. Um, now, he had had, though, a great success, or was having a great success with Tommy anyway, and so quite naturally he declined that. Um, but he said, well, what about the Iron Man? Because I've written these songs, and I've always wanted to take that further. So um, Pete was the driving force for it in the first instance. Um, and Pete had strung together a sort of loose narrative, but primarily was looking at writing the songs, if you like, inspired by it. So my early contribution was to convince um, Pete that we should go right back to the Iron Man, the, the story, the short story, the primary source material, if you like, and use that and develop that and not, um, in, a, in a sense, not divert too much from that. Now, the and, great... And did you bring in Hughes at this stage? No, the, uh, Ted's great gift was to allow us to do that. And he was extremely generous to allow that process to take place. Now, I think I should say, and um, perhaps we could talk about this later if it's interesting or useful, the Iron Man is unfinished business, I would say. Um, so I don't think we'll be talking about 
a completed piece of work for reasons I could describe. But so in the first instance, um, it was Pete and I collaborating on trying to make this work. And my attempt was to see if I could get a beat to adjust the lyrics of, of the songs to some extent um, and to accept going back to the text, which I have here, the kind of script of the version that we did, um, which those who know it begins exactly, I guess, if you've got the text of the story there, um, the first recitative is the Iron Man came to the top of the cliff. Where had he come from? Nobody knows. How far had he walked? Nobody knows. You know, and, and almost entirely, we just used his text. So how do you think this introduced him to what's going to be a decade <coughs> drama, as well as all the other things he did? I mean, it's hard to get a handle on the amount of work he was doing, but how, did you think the Iron Man was a key, or do you think it was a, a, a ship that passed in the night, but he said, oh, I might get on that? Well, it, it could have put him off, actually, in, in certain <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't. Well, I think, um, as I said, his generosity was to let us yeah. do it. Yeah. Then he came to see it um, in, re in the rehearsal room. Yeah. Um, and Carol saw it as well, came in the rehearsal room, and he was extremely generous and supportive at that point. Mm. And at that point, he gave suggestions and, and often um, line amendments or whatever, things that he thought could improve it and develop it. Now, because it was, as Tim will know, the Young Vic doesn't have long rehearsal periods, and this, in one sense, was a, um, a, a big ask for the um, theatre. should also say that Pete Townsend was extremely generous in putting money into it to enable mm. the production to happen, particularly the musical side of it. So um, as it got closer to the opening, um, the, the main task, which Ted was very supportive of, was to try to make sure at least the narrative was coherent. Okay, so he had that experience there with the Iron Man. Can we go quite quickly, if you don't mind, it's up to, it's up to you really, but to um, um, Spring Awakening? Yeah, well, there's a funny link here which might connect back to this question of how the Iron Man turned him on to theatre again. It was I, I bumped into Ted Hughes in the corridors of the Young Vic when I was coming in to take over David's position there. And... Uh, he he had he was watching Iron Man. Now I I had a feeling I I wanted to do a production of Grim Tales, just very very brief and, and swift the diversion, the 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 great Grim Tales. And I had a feeling that Ted's relationship to myth, legend, and words would suit those stories very well. So having never met him before, I felt he was in a good mood, enjoying the theatre, you know, being in that cranky wonderful space. And I asked him would he do this version of Grimm's? I didn't hear anything from him. Absolute silence for months. So I don't think he was too excited about theatre at that That's point. An isn't it? But <laughs> what is interesting is I did get a card about two weeks before I started rehearsal saying, did to himself, well, I've been thinking I would like to do your Grimm tales if it's not too late, by which time I'd already commissioned Carol Ann Duffy to do a version. So I said, unfortunately, it is a bit late, but come and see it. If you like it, I've got something else in mind. And, and that was Spring Awakening. I Why did you have that in mind for, well, for him? A, Just a second. Why did you have that in mind for him? What did you think would attract him by, from Spring Awakening? From Spring Awakening? Yeah. Spring Awakening is this um, fantastic uh, uh, German uh, expressionist late uh, 19th century piece, which often is treated rather awkwardly in English translation. The best existing English translation was Edward Bond's, which treats it as sort of pre-Brecht. What I felt, because Spring Awakening is about the un unstoppable, irrepressible force of sexuality in children, that's what it's about. And it's about the German Victorian attempt to quash that with disastrous results, suicide, rape, and so on. And I thought that Ted, would shine a completely unexpected light on that inner force, that he wouldn't so much get hung up on the 
um, realistic impression, nor would he get hung up on, on an attempt to sort of create a version of German or pre-Brecht expressionism. He would go right to the heart, which is exactly what he did, of this inner experience, what it feels like to be driven by that passion and the absurdity of trying to suppress it. Did you work up an or did you work on an already existing translation? We got commissioned for him a kind of literal line by line yeah. translation. His German was good, but he needed he needed sort of assistance here and there. So we got a sort of line by line commission and then he lined up the other existing translations to cross-refer to. Something I'll come to, and I'll bring the two of you in on this question after you've answered this, that, that these are called versions, mm -hmm. not translations. Now, um, is, this, is there a distinction? What does a version mean to you that is not a translation? I think there is a distinction. I think it cuts both ways. It's, it's both an acknowledgement from the writer, in this case Ted, that he's not translating directly from the German. So he's not trying to pretend that he's doing something he's not. And what restraints, hand, what restraints does he put on himself? I mean, things that happen in the original have to happen in his version, version or does he change those things in his version? It, it varies because, of course, with Racine, when, when he did third, he didn't try and replicate the Alexandrine. He, and it, so it, inevitably was a version, as indeed the Racine was a version of, of, of Eurip Euripides. As so, indeed, yes. So, well, Seneca is saying it too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so th but it's inevitably a, a version. It's not a, it's not a replication. Yeah. And, yeah. and although uh, he's very lit uh, he, he responds very literally to the narrative, uh, the, the form is obviously very different. But, but, but the Spring Awakening and the Lorca, for example, yeah. he's following it line by line. Well, let's right. stick with the Spring Awakening one at a time. Line by line, he's following it. The sense of version, as, as, as Jonathan says, is, is more in the line by line linguistic choices. He doesn't change the structure of any lines. He doesn't put one thing there and one thing there, which some versions do. So there's many different ways to cut the cloth of the yeah. version. Is there a sense in which he leans on particular parts of it? Uh, more than you would expect from, or more than had been done before. Um, parts of, sorry. Of the Spring Awakening. Parts of the Spring Awakening. Well, yeah. what, what I was going to wonder, the tying up between, it's so, I'm so happy to know that you were in there with that audience, because I don't know the experience you had, but the audience was extremely diverse in terms of the age in particular. Um, and so about Iron Man, no, Iron Man audience, yeah, Iron Man audience, it, like young children there with their parents and their grandparents. And I know from certainly the people I know who went, I have a photograph, which I should really um, pick up and show you of Ted with my children in front of the Iron Man. But anyway, <laughs> my point I was going to ask you, um, Tim, is um, the thing that ha there's something in common between Spring Awakening and the Iron Man, which is the centrality of children, isn't there? You know, the, the, uh, in, in not just being for children, but actually children being at the heart of the narrative. Absolutely. Now this, and that's a key thing just to say in, re, in re answer to Melvin's uh, question and what you just said, David, uh, when Vedekin wrote Spring Awakening, he decided that children could not portray the parts of children. And he decided that young women had to play the young boys and the girls, because these are 14-year-old characters going through extreme and explicit sexual experiences. Ted and I made the decision that kids should play these roles, even though it was being done at the RSC, so it was done at the, on the highest stage, that we should get kids 14, 15-year-olds. And what he did, which I think is so brilliant in this version, is that other translators, including Edward Bond, who's terrific as well, tends to stand outside the, chil the children's experience, tends to slightly objectify what's happening to them within, as I said, a sort of Brechtian distance. And what do you mean exactly by that? I mean that, that, that the children's experience is portrayed with a sort of analytical frame, which is, which is nothing wrong with that. That places it within a Marxist tradition. But what Ted did is he got inside what it feels like to be a child, but also did that with his fantastic sense of the mythic continuum. So it's quite what hard. What was the mythic continuum? The mythic continuum is the force of 
irrepressible sexual potency. So it's not like a sort of a, a, a televisual, realistic, naturalistic study of the child's experience sexually. It's, it, 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 it's this idea of possession, which is another fundamental idea of, of p possession and transformation. And he got right inside that language of that, of that text. Yeah, we talk, can we talk about some of the characters to bring it a bit more? I mean, what he got, you're talking about he got inside and got, and absolutely, and I'm with you. It's sort of essayistic. I mean, he has these characters, these boys, the school teachers, and, that, and he gets hold of them and brings us to your generalizations, as it were, through individuals in that way. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Well, he, um, yes. I mean, he, he was a natural dramatist in so many... What does that mean? Well, for example, he he was subject. He, he allowed his characters to be subjective, and that and it was the conflict of various subjectivities that that made so much of his theatre alive. And it was the energy of his writing too, yeah. the narrative thrust and energy, which I think made him a, a natural. It's always the energy, isn't it? Yeah, the energy. In I the mean, the, the energy of his poetry, yeah. but then it found such full expression in the energy of of of, of, of theatre. Do you go along with that? Yes, I do. And I had um, the privilege, it was, and it was a privilege, of working with Ted as he recorded his, some of his poems. And actually, he and I engaged with the question about how best to read them. He asked you to help him with the reading of his yeah, dramatic yes, poems. Yes, yes. And it was fantastic. I bet it was. For, uh, for me. And, and of course, to begin with, I was... Um, so I can't. How can I? Po how can I possibly tell you how to re read or obey? It's a ridiculous proposition. But now this came directly out of the Iron Man, the work on the Iron Man, the little we'd done together. And so what I agreed was, I said, well, I'm, but I'd love to do that, but my role will be just to tell you if they're clear to me or not. And I won't know all of them. And I intentionally didn't read the ones that uh, that I didn't know. Um, and but what I think was most interesting for me was um, Ted engaging with his own voice and not being doing poetry reciting but actually allowing them to pass through him as if they were narratives his own narratives and there's a sense in which some one of you writes about him not being not sort of not cajoling training uh, the royal Shakespeare idea now the Royal Shakespeare has done some wonderful things, but having having his characters go at the uh, go at the work, go at the text in a different way, is that right? Yeah, I mean he had. Well, to, I, I, I remember, what was that different way? Well, he it, it was. He, he, I remember him in two rehearsals. I remember him with the kids actors in Spring Awakening, patiently going through every text with the with the young kids, the boys and the girls there. And I remember in the Blood Wedding. Uh, which we'll come to later, but that that sense he had no time for a, 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 an actor not connecting with the urgency and imperative of the text. And how was this different from the way that these things had been done before? Because I think it's you make a, a point in, in, in your long essay, a long essay of yours that I read, which is excellent, that he stood aside from the way that people say, we keep using the Royal Shakespeare because it's such a handy example and so replete with examples, uh, then it had happened there. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question and to, to, to put your finger on it, I, I don't know whether you've got an insight on this, Jonathan. He, 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 had, he, just, he just had no time for the, 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 he had no time for the fancy, he had no time for the disconnected, he had no time for the, for the, for the afloat. For people who aren't so versed in all our jargon of theatre, do you mean because I think what I would mean is he wanted it to be real. He didn't want phony voices overlaying the text. And actually, there's a certain kind of acting of Shakespeare that is, in my view, entirely phony, is that people reciting, reciting Shakespeare rather than embodying through the language, the, te the synthesis of language, text and emotion and psychology. Now, I can only say that from my little experience of him reading his poems, because what he responded to in any feedback I gave him was essentially 
you mean make it less poetic? Just also, let it be my voice. Jonathan, we also, we, we talked about this, that and the other. It's still a bit abstract, isn't it? It seemed to me that what he got a grip on was what these characters were like, these boys were like. Mm. Uh, and when we come to the teachers, which, which is a bit problematic in some ways. Yes. But let's say let's, let's what the boy... And he went for their character, yeah. apprehensive, full of appetites, whatever it was, and it was through them. It was That was the Shakespeare thing, seemed to yeah. me. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, he also, he confronted, I, I can only speak with any any kind of authority on, on, on the Racine. But We're coming to the Racine. Yeah, but he confronted, and I think, but I think this is true of all his dramatic writing, he confronted the, the extremes of it. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't sidestep anything, and uh, I mean that worked extremely well in 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 Ferd, But I think also co he he confronted the sexual and psychological uh, desires and difficulties of all these plays without sugar coating or without sidestepping. And he was also, I mean, he took on in in Spring Awakening the very strange ending, yeah. um, which is you suddenly think whoop. Where are we going now? Yeah, uh, it's yeah. like in, being in a sway boat, and all, you're going up, and your stomach's there, and you're going up, and you think, what's going on here? But that works very well. It does work very well, and he's brilliant at that. And that was a second thing, uh, Melvin, that drew, drew me, made me feel he'd be right for this text. He has to do it with Lorca as well. He, he, he can get to grips with the surreal, with the symbolic, mm -hmm. with the abstract, yeah. and he can make it alive and funny and, and concrete. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel odd in his hands. How did it go down? That, it went down extremely well, the Spring Awakening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as Is a it? text and as a and yeah. as a performance. So you've been you've been um, pulling at the bit. Uh, about blood wedding, shall we move on to that? Well, <laughs> it, but, but, but blood wedding is perhaps more totally natural. Ted Hughes. Territory. Can you just give people a bit of background about blood wedding? Well, blood wedding was one of the four main plays we have from the great Spanish poet Lorca, uh, who was killed in the, by the fascists in the, in, in the Civil War in the 30s. He, he, he's a standout figure for 20th century poets, and I knew that Ted admired him greatly, and particularly admired an essay of Lorca's on the Duende. The Duende is, again, it's back to this idea of the passion that takes you over. Lorca describes being in a bar in Andalusia and hearing a singer singing uh, and being taken by the Duende, the devil, the force of the devil, which is the creative force of performance. And Lorca defined that as the essence of theatre, and Ted looked to that poem as a good expression of what he was looking for in theatre. So I knew he had a thing about, about Lorca, and indeed, although I think the Spring Awakening text is, is superb, and coming back to it, I, 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 I'm amazed by it, the Lorca text is on another level of... Um, in what way on another level? Well, I was going to say, because you've been trying to get me, us, away from generalisation, and try and sense what is the Hughesian nature of theatre writing. Well, it's there in Blood Wedding. It's where he strips everything aside and with great forceful economy, he can express how a character is feeling, the desire or the need or the urgency or the violence. And he cuts away in his version of Blood Wedding um, anything that gets in the way of that most essential thing. So I have to say we have to be careful because it's, he's not a real writer. There are far more writers writing today in his wake who are much more real in terms of real meaning, in terms of talking like people talk. What Ted does is he manages to make sound natural the innermost simple fact of necessity of a character. So it's very strange. It, it, it's not like speech, and yet it is like living through speech. When well, you start to have to... Well, that's no different than what the issue is with Shakespeare, is it? When I said real early, I didn't mean naturalistic, like it's Coronation Street or something. Mm. But what I meant was that the actor is able to embody it as if it is actually happening to them, mm. that they're not outside of it. And I would suggest that, I wish I'd seen the blood wedding from what, what you 
describe it, that that would be what would be... Well, you'll get it by reading it. It's, yes, it's there on the page. Yes. It is. Yes. And what's extraordinary when you open it, given the lushness of, and the density of his language in most of the things, it's, a, it's as spare as Beckett. Yes. Yep. And, yes. Um, and you think... That, um, I don't want to make furious comparisons, but it is as spare as Beckett, and even more spare than Pinter. From the set-off, it works, yes. because the relationship is so powerful. Yes. And that's why I keep coming back to the relationship about this young man and his mother. The relationship is so powerful. Uh, and he makes that work. Is that in the text? Is that in the original? Or did he pare it down when he did his version? It's in the original, but he achieves it in English in a particular way to him, in a way that is particular to him. I mean, Lorca, Lorca was a very great writer and had that. But I think you're absolutely right, Melvin, of course. It's his ability to engage with the uh, present emotional experience of the characters that's going to make it work. But he does something else that is so important with theatre, which is to do with economy. He can have two people saying, like, 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 like uh, with the mother and the bridegroom um, at the beginning, the first scene of Blood Wedding, he can have them talking about um, uh, one thing while something else is, what, is the thing that's going on. And that fantastic economy mm. to know that while you're talking about one thing, you're actually dealing with this other thing. What I think is more, and I, I agree with that, what I think is more um, impressive, for me anyway, here we are, uh, is he's got you. I mean, the tension is there at the beginning. Yes. And it's just him talking, her talking to her, her son about whether he goes out or not. It's just, and you just, and I'm not being stupid about this. I know I'm not being stupid anyway. But the tension is there. You think something really important is going on here. Yes. And I'm hooked. Yes, yes. Because I went off with the other one. Yes, I went. You would have done the same. I was a woman on fire, inside and outside, ablaze with agonies. Your son was a single drop of water that I hoped would give me children and health. The other was a dark, big river carrying torn up trees that brought me the sound of its reeds and its song. And I was going with your son your little boy of cold water. But the other sent thousands of birds that struck to me and dropped frost into the wounds of this poor shriveling woman, this girl possessed by flames. I didn't want to. Do you hear me? I didn't want to. My whole hope was your son and I haven't deceived him. But the other's arm dragged me like a wave from the sea. And it would have always dragged me, always, even if I had been an old woman and all your son's sons had tried to hold me down by my hair. And I think because Lorca is, I think, hugely elusive in, in, in English, and I think this is by far the, the, the greatest yeah. version of, of Lorca that I know. And, bec and I think the secret lies in his spareness, the tautness, mm -hmm. and the tension of that spareness of, yeah. of writing. Is what, what, do you what do you make of the songs? Do you, uh, are, you, are you familiar with this? No, no. And when we're Please. talking here, what do you make of the songs that keep the, the girls singing the songs, the verses that go through? Well, I, I think that what he's brilliant at in both Spring Awakening and this is writing the abstract and the surreal, like we said. So the, the moon, the moon speech, the yeah. beggar woman speech, the woodcutter speech, Speech. Uh, it, the, the, the one thing that works less well in his blood wedding is the song, as it's a song, also. is the song. Yeah. It works as poetry, it's fantastic, but when we set it to music, it, it wasn't the best song lyric. Um, Maybe the music wasn't up to it. Uh, well, I think, to be, to be fair on the musician, and I say that in all respect to Ted, but I just think that he, he wrote slightly more, 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 more verse than song there. And, 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 and um, you mentioned the teachers in Spring Awakening. He does the teachers good, but it's not, it's not, it's not the area he most illuminates. Yeah. Edward Bond had a had a better bash at the teachers because he wanted to bash them. The teachers in Spring Awakening are the authoritarians who believe that this boy who has done something quite straightforward, yeah. uh, as is the source of all evil, must be sent to a reformatory school, exactly. must be accepted as an example. And at the same time, the great thing about that scene is that one of them keeps 
complaining that it's cold could somebody close a window yeah yeah it's yes. fantastic yeah it's, it's very it's very funny i i think when ted ted's sense of human absurdity is is is, is at its best when he can really understand the figure who has been made a fool of, uh, like Midas in Ovid, which I know we're not coming to yet. I think I think the teachers just weren't deeply interesting to him, and nor did Vedekind give Ted enough to really get behind. He, he, his parents, the, he writes the parents very well because he can understand what the parents are going through more. So what more would one want to say about blood wedding? It begins to dawn on me what might happen, which will be a terrible thing, and then it dawns, and then it happens, and it is terrible. And yeah. he paces it. He paces it very well, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, he... Because, I mean, you don't know, you don't think, oh, I know what's going on, she's going to run away with him. Yeah. But you don't get that for a long time. Yeah. He knows, he knows how to write, it's very hard to, you're going to accuse me of generalisation, he knows how to write a ritual. I'm glad you're getting it. He knows... He knows... Ted, Ted, Ted knew that Lorca was trying to write a ritual, a ritualistic theatre, yeah. and Ted knew that it, it was going to happen. We know it's going to happen. The mother's obsessed with it. The mother lives in the moment when her husband and her other son were killed. The mother, the mother knows that blood will come again, mm -hmm. and when it comes, it comes like the turn of a wheel. It comes like the moon coming out every night, and Ted gets the theatrical shape. Is it, is it uh, Ted or you in your comedy who said that he saw it as something like a carnival? We, we talked about that. I'm not yeah. sure whether it was Ted or me or, or, or Lorca. Uh, it, it might, I mean, it might well have been yeah. Lorca's idea. But uh, it, that was one of the words that uh, Ted and I certainly used in, in talking about it. Um, but, 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 I, but I just think the, the, the only other thing I'd say about... Um, uh, uh, about Blood Wedding is when it comes to Ted writing, uh, and we'll have a reading of this uh, by Archana Ramaswamy, um, when it comes to Ted writing how it feels to do what you know is wrong, what you know is condemned, what you know will kill you, but to not do that thing is impossible for you. Mm. When it comes to him writing what he called in Ovid the subjectivity of passion, uh, he does that so indescribably well, uh, and, and, and I think in Blood Wedding, that's the very height of, of, of extraordinary writing is between the, 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 bride, the, the bride and Leonardo and the bride at the end. And, and I, I would only say that you, you're quite right to point out again and again, Melvin, that he brings the character somehow close to us, and yet he in no way diminishes the extraordinary uniqueness of that moment. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what we'd all say, wouldn't we? It always feels unique to us when we're in the extremes of passion. But and he gets that. The dramatic suddenness of it and the melodramatic even, the yes. convincing ending. Uh, where yes. it's, uh, uh, it's something out of Gothic literature. Well, he was very near that, wasn't he? Yes. yes. You yes. mean the two of them killing each other yeah, in the woods, yeah, in, the, yeah. in the moon. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Could I pick up something that you were introducing earlier about um, the notion of the version? Um, now, I, the only comparable experience I have is a number of playwrights who have written translations slash versions of other great plays. Now, um, did you feel with um, Ted working on this that his primary impulse was to serve, as it were, Lorca by finding a way of m finding an English equivalent to what Lorca would have written had he written in English, seems to me the task of the translator as it were, or did you feel that he, he very clearly wanted to alter the play for his own purposes? Now I don't mean that uh, disrespectfully to Ted at all, but because Arthur Miller would be a good comparison with an enemy of the people when he was quite clear that he wanted and did change fundamental things about an enemy of the people because he found them distasteful in various ways to create a play which I don't think could possibly be written by either playwright, Miller or Ibsen, but Miller was definitely and quite openly doing his version. Mm. 
I think now, that's very, very that? interesting and very clear. And I think Ted did another thing, a third thing, yes. which is that he, he acted like a conduit, like an electrical force conduit between the writer and his own audience in his own time. He was like, you know, when you, when you plunge the, the, the machinery into the ground and the, the oil bursts out. I think that's what Ted did. So he didn't alter anything. He didn't alter anything. I don't think he had that kind of uh, um, way of seeing things that, that, that Arthur Miller did. Um, and I know you, you worked much more closely with him than I, but I think Ted felt that he didn't need to alter anything, but he certainly didn't feel he was serving anybody. Or he just felt that he wouldn't do the project if he wasn't deeply committed to what that writer was doing. And then he acts like a sort of transmitter into English and and to do that he modernizes phrases he uses words like nuclear in Ovid or he you know uh, but in, in Blood Wedding less modernization but he'll use the words he like 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 the economy is so flinty he manages to get his language as if it's born in the earth and I don't think Lorca's got that I think Lorca had that more naturally I think Ted is inserted an, an extra clarity of that to give the, the English year and an English audience. So the idea sense. was he the ideal collaborator, as it were, it, but like in a sense, it sounds like to it, me. No, no to, to was Ted to were they meeting oh, in, for them, in heaven, them. for example? <laughs> would it, would it be the great collaboration that was him finding a way of expressing for Lorca? a play for an English audience that Lorca could not have expressed himself. He, he, yeah, but even then, I don't think it was so much for Lorca. It was, it was more like a kind of... Um, um, with Lorca, then, can so He was a sort of... With divine, he uses a brilliant phrase about Ovid, that Ovid divined. He divined these myths. He, he kind of pulled them out of one place and put them in another place. And I think that's, that's Ted's great gift. I mean, when we, you're, you're about to come to the big classical stuff, uh, Melvin, I know, because we're going on to Phaedra, Ovid, and then Oresteia. Ted was up to those writers because he didn't need to change them. He didn't need to make modern equivalents. He didn't need to adapt them. He, he took them. And I think that's what he did with Lorca. I think he treated Lorca on that scale. Can we go to Phaedra now? And uh, can you tell people, can you give people a mini resume of it, and then we'll talk about Pedro. Well, it, it, it's, as you know, it's Racine, but it's Racine based on the Euripides and with, with some of Seneca. Um, and it is about uncontrollable passion. And it's about the terrible effects of, of desire and love, which is not able to be constrained. And- So to be, but to, can we personify it a bit? Well, it is about this woman who, this woman Phaedra, who falls in love with her stepson, and thinking that her her husband has been killed, she declares her love. Her husband comes back. She then accuses her her stepson of trying to rape her, and uh, and in the end, the the. The, the, the son Hippolytus runs away and is killed by a monster rising out of the sea. Because his father Fisius cursed, 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 cursed him, cursed him. Yeah, yeah. and Neptune. That's the curse. Yeah, and uh, and then Phaedra confesses and and uh, kills herself. So when you when that came to you, what, how did you set about it, and how did you, did you and Ted set about it? Well, I. I asked him to, well, I actually, before that, I'd asked him to do Medea, and he hadn't been able to, or I don't know, actually, I think he hadn't been able to, it wasn't that he particularly didn't want to do it. But then uh, three or four years later, I wrote to him in 97, uh, asking him to... Was to that do, Diana Riggs, Medea? Yeah. yeah. I saw that, it was very good. Um, uh, but it wasn't in his version. No, 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 no. Just a little, like, a little tiny digression. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but uh, then, uh, I, so I wrote to him again and heard nothing back and thought, oh, well, he's clearly not interested um, or not, yeah, certainly not going to do it. And three or four months later, a version, I mean, uh, his version dropped through the letterbox. Complete, he'd completed, he'd set to work and completed it. And uh, it was completely astonishing uh, because although he did some variation it was pretty much the version that we did when we when we came to do it 
which we did in, in London and in, in New York. Um, Who was Helen Mirren in your first? Uh, Fedra was, was Helen Mirren Fedra, is that right? No, 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 no. She did it in his version later on at the uh, National right. Theatre. No, yeah. it was Dinah Rigg. I did Again, it. It was all. See, it was yeah. all a sort yeah. of continuation from yeah. having done uh, yeah. Madeira, um, and it was an astonishing version. It was a sort of. It was inevitably, as I said, a, a, a version that it wasn't in Alexandrine, but it was. It was surprisingly faithful to, to the uh, Racine, but it was it was a, a landslide of. A, a rock slide of language. And it was water, yes, rock slide, and better than I was going to say, a waterfall of language. What do you do as a director <clears throat> when you're faced with these massively long speeches? Two hours. Uh, yeah. uh, let's say a couple of pages and people know what we're talking about. And one person talking about generally something that happened in the past but could be excused, but might not be excused. What do you do about it directing it? You just let them stand there. How do you, what do you say to them? What do you say to Ted to help you on that? Well, to, I mean, such was the compelling nature of what he was writing, or compelling nature of his of, of his writing. language mm. of the writing that it it it's sort of hypnotic. It becomes, and there is a great. I mean, the the, the, the huge speech in it is the report by the by Hippolytus, the the, the, the son's tutor, of his death and this monster rising from the sea. And that is some of, I think, some of Ted Hughes's greatest writing. It is completely, you can hardly breathe listening to it. Exactly. And it had that effect, astonishingly, on an English West End audience. Is that in the, in the original text? Oh, yes, yes. That there a monster comes out of the sea? Yes. And the head itself is a beast? Yes, yes, uh, yes. And it's yes. plated it's all, and so all, on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, it's astonishing how, how faithful he was to, to Racine. Why do you think he, as it were, um, conjoined with it so tightly? What do you think appealed about it to him to make him, to enable him to write so powerfully? Well, I think if you read his poetry, he un... He un he understood and the savage nature, the savage ways of nature, and by extension, the, the savagery and terror of, of, and shame of our human natures. And, uh, and he was unafraid to, to confront them. Mm. Uh, he didn't in any, I mean, that's where in a way, it is wasn't it isn't Shakespearean. It doesn't it uh, directs these emotions head on, and without without mm, without metaphor, just it's a it's a relentless gazing at at the appalling nature of this of these uh, yes of, of, of not only incest but the. Uh... The, the passion for incest itself, yes. yes. Desire, mm. what desire and, and yes. love does to us. And then vengeance, uh, yeah. his father on him because of what he thinks yes, well, uh, is done. Yes. And on yeah. we go. Yes. yes. But, but an unflinching gaze at it. And, uh, you know, you talked about the spareness of, 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 of the Lorca. But the spareness of the language in... in uh, in the Racine, and which is of course true to Racine, because Racine, I think, used only eight hundred words in in third. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he, overall, in his whole all his work, I think he only used, I think it was four thousand words, whereas Shakespeare uses thirty two thousand. So, and that that I think is one of the what what Hughes managed to do. What he managed to is to distill and to and to almost with a laser-like, uh, unflinching gaze at, at the terrible effects of, of, of our monstrous loves. I've read it a couple of times, or two or three, two, two, two times properly over the last uh, week or two. Uh, how, would you how would you describe his achievement in making the lines so powerful? It's a very funny question, but it's, a, it's another good, obvious question, I think. What's, what, what is he doing to make that line so powerful? Well, they all have narrative thrust. 
They all, there's a, I mean, we said earlier, one of his great qualities was his energy, the energy of his writing. And it's like being, it's like getting aboard a train. You can't stop. It just, it runs for the, they, they last an hour, 20 minutes. Mm. And it's, it's a headlong white knuckle rush. Mm. And it's, it's appalling in a good way. <laughs> We were hardly clear of the city gates and onto the beach road towards Mycenae. Hippolytus was leading. In his chariot, his bodyguards close round him. A sombre troop. The prince was taciturn. His mood made the mood of every man. We all shared one dark thought and were silent. No sound but the click of hooves and the jingle of harness. Those horses of his were strange, usually so bursting with spirit, so headstrong, so eager to be off. They need the constant touch of his voice and the reins to hold them in. Today, they were listless. He left the pace to them, letting the reins lie loose over their backs. They hung their heads. They seemed preoccupied as if they were helping him with their hanging heads to think what he was thinking. I noticed it. It seemed very strange. As I was watching that, a sudden skull-splitting roar, an indescribable, terrible, tearing voice, like lightning flash and thunderclap together, made us all duck and cower. It came out of the sea, as if the whole sea had bellowed. And then, like an echo to it, another roaring groan, subterranean, as if something that groaned were trying to scream, rolled through the earth under our feet. The ground was bulging, jumping between us. We were petrified and bewildered. The horses' manes and tails flared on end, and now I saw out at sea a mountain of water boiling up, heaping higher, erupting from under the horizon and racing towards us till it towered above us, seeming to hang. And there, in slow motion, it collapsed a solid fall of thunder quaking the bedrock, and out of it the foam cascading from a colossal body came a beast. Up the sands with the fury of a supernatural existence, its head was one huge monster all to itself, like a bull's head with bull's horns. But from the shoulders backwards, the whole body was plated, humped and plated. The scales greeny yellow, a nauseating colour that sickened the eye. And beyond the humped bulk of the body came scaled and lashing coils, half bull, half dragon, mouth hanging open like a cavern and bellowing like a heavy surf exploding in a cavern. The earth trembled, the air was thick with horror, we breathed a mist of horror. Weapons or courage were out of the question. Everybody fled. We all took cover in that small temple among the tombs. Then I looked back and saw Hippolytus. He was lashing his horses and making a run straight at the monster. At the last moment, I saw him swerve tight past its jaws and bury a javelin all but for a span length of the shaft behind that thing's shoulder, right where the heart is in creatures that have hearts. I never saw anything so fearless. But whether the javelin blade found a heart or the beast was convulsed with fury at his daring, the whole mass of it rose and collapsed onto Hippolytus like another mountain of ocean or a giant octopus of water. I saw horses and chariot tossing among foam and tentacles that drag back down towards the sea. But then, like a miracle, the horses were clambering free, like a team scrambling across an avalanche. And I saw Hippolytus braced in the chariot, fists bunched and legs wide. I thought he was getting clear, 
But a god was watching in a surf of churning sand. A last scything swipe of the monster's tail came round under their hooves, toppled the horses, and smashed the wheels of the chariot. Then the horses went mad. I heard Hippolyta shouting among the screams of the horses and the blasts of that beast. The wonderful strength of Hippolytus was helpless. Some of the others saw something I can hardly credit. I did not see it. They saw the glowing figure of a naked god astride the shoulders of the demented horses, goading and urging them among the rocks of the foreshore, with the chariot stripped of its wheels, bounding like a bucket behind them. Hippolytus had wound his arms in the reins. He tore the horses' mouths, but they felt nothing, and the voice they had grown up with became a scream that added to their terror as the chariot disintegrated beneath him. Then it was two mad horses dragging a man. Oh, Lord, forgive me. The sight of it it's like a great wound through my body. It's never going to heal. The horses galloped away with their weightless bundle that had fed them. And that was your son. <laughs> did you ever think uh, he's got the wrong word or did he ever say, have I got the right word? No, he did. He surprisingly little. He, he came to rehearsal and changed word, occasional phrases and words, but not nearly as much as many writers I worked with. Um, and they were usually to help what, what he detected was a difficulty that the actor had. Why do you think he's turning to the classics at this time? Because now we're going on to Ovid, uh, about whom he's written, the, well you started, Interpretation from Ovid, shape changing the and the great Ovid of, of two hundred and fifty tales and and so on. Um, what attracted him to Ovid? What's pulling him towards these classical texts? I see you 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 chap shoving him towards them. <laughs> he Ovid. it was the mythic though, of course. That's where he responded to the mythic. He's all all his yeah, life. He, he, he I think the nature of myth and these are and the nature of the gods you know in the racine this is, the god is made manifest but the the gods are also internalized in that we can't resist them instead of them being outside us they are within us they are they become our stereotypes so can we move to orbit now yeah who wants to lead with orbit Tim, I think. Well, I'm sorry. Tim. I feel... Could I ask? Am yeah. I allowed to yeah, just sure ask? Allowed a, to. A, go you back a to go. a question. No, I'd just like to go back to a question earlier. I was like dying to ask you about Spring Awakening. Was Ted uh, hoping, or indeed w intending, that the audience would comprise a lot of young people of the age of the Central Contact players, no. or was this an adult event? Well, not, neither. He, he, he in, quite rightly, in my opinion, didn't write for a particular audience. Um, he's very, he was very humble, Ted. I mean, we're talking about him as a titanic force, which he was. But working with him on Spring Awakening, which wasn't his comfort zone compared to Lorca, he was very humble about how can I do this. He did, I think, by the sound of it, much more than with Fedra, much more with Lorca. We went through it word by word and he was saying, shall I do this, shall I do this? Lorca, no, he just he took not. away and he did. But, yeah. but the Spring Awakening, so I think that he, he didn't really think about the audience. He thought about the, the play. Um, he knew it was for the RSC, uh, so he probably knew it would, would be mostly an adult audience. Uh, I'd love to show it to kids, but it was written for an adult audience, of course. Vedekin wrote it for an adult audience. Um, I feel embarrassed that I'm talking so much, but I was lucky enough to do three works with him yeah. in the 90s. Yeah. Well, so, let's yeah. talk about Ovid, if you want to share and jump in. Uh, well, he, there's, he, there are a dozen of, a dozen of the Ovid stories in, in, this, in this collection that we've got in front of Yeah, about of eight, I think. Yeah, something like that, eight, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like we did, we did uh, like uh, uh, four big ones and four smaller ones. We kind of moved between epics oh, and I sort see. of ditties, oh, if you see what I mean. So you had the epics of, uh, you had Narcissus, you had... Uh, uh, Murrah, 
who sleeps with her father. You had uh, uh, Tereus and uh, Philomel, that, the, the terrible story of, 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 of the man who rapes his wife's sister. And then we have Minerva and Arachne. Yeah. Um, and then we had smaller ones Semele. like Salmachus and Af Hermaphrodite, Selene, yeah. and, Ty and, and uh, uh, Tiresias, how he lost his yeah. sight. So these little... Uh, ones and we wove them together into a into a kind of um, pattern or movement and ho a bigger narrative. So what what how would you describe that in terms of drama? I mean, they're obviously stories. People would say perhaps they're fables. People would say they're fanciful. Yeah. Uh, but we're talking about them in terms of drama now. Yeah. Can we take one or two? Just I mean, everybody will know about Narcissus, and everybody will know about Midas. Mm. Uh, maybe I mean, but let's talk about those two to get going. Yeah, well, Bacchus as well. The Bacchae we could we could talk about. Yeah, but let's talk about okay. Echo. Um, Narcissus yes. is obvious, and yes. Midas is obvious, and that's yes. their strength for this particular discussion. Okay. Well, I tell you, their problem for this particular discussion is those were two of the least dramatic of the tales. <coughs> that's not Ted. That's of it, because of course we have to remember as part of this discussion, Ted never intended this material to be put on stage. He did what Ovid did, which is make them brilliantly speakable. And if you want to hear Ovid, Ted's Ovid, you listen to Ted's recording, which I'm sure is still available. I mean, it's as good as you're going to get. Um, what we did is we took his, his, uh, his oral uh, verse and made it into dramas. Now, so each story was its own distinct drama. It's like a play of short stories. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, Narcissus is, 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 I would say, reading it again, one of our less successful adaptations, not Ted's, because dramatically it's quite hard, Narcissus. It's a beautiful story, but in the theatre it tells rather like a narrative. Echo falls in love with Narcissus. Narcissus won't return her, lo his lo her love. Uh, Echo fades away into the world, which is why we have Echo. Narcissus falls in love with himself, falls in the water, dies, and there's a Narcissus plant. So what it lacks is dramatic tension, as you were talking about, say, with Blood Wedding. The stories that have dramatic tension are, for example, um, uh, 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 Bacchus, which uh, is the story of the king, Pentheus, who defies the god Bacchus tries to banish him and ends up being ripped apart by his mother and his aunt and so on. The reason why that's got dramatic tension is it's got the scene where Pentheus says, you will not worship this god. Whatever happens, we will banish this god. And people come to him and say, you shouldn't banish the god. And he insists that he will banish the god. So it's got the kind of core dramatic scene where you see a character um, by their own folly uh, or by their own stubbornness, you see them fall into disaster. So it's got action, conflict, consequence. Um, a, a, another great example of that, which people won't know, but I have to mention it because this is a great story, is Murder, who it's like Romeo and Juliet meets Oedipus. I mean, it's a, such an extraordinary story. The daughter who loves no other man but her father, who must have her father, who knows that she mustn't have her father but will have her father and it's got all the scenes of torment where she said I mustn't but I must I mustn't but I must she tries to kill herself there's a nurse character which is why it's like Romeo and Juliet who says what's wrong with you my dear and just like Oedipus the girl keeps saying don't ask me what's wrong with me don't ask me and the nurse insists that she tell her so Myrrha tells her nurse that she wants to sleep with her father and then, and then persuades the nurse to make it possible. So in the cover of darkness, Myrrha sleeps with her father. Until the light comes on. Until the light comes on, he sees her face, she runs away. But again, it's got the drama. So I think that's a slightly different question than the rest of our discussion, uh, Melvin, because it's not so much a question of how Ted made drama. It's a question of the inherent drama of his verse, which I think is an interesting mirror reversal of our whole discussion, actually. Mm -hmm. And he, I mean, if you read, you don't have to see our show, which of course is 20 years long dead and wasn't recorded in those days. If you hear him read Murder, uh, Tereus and uh, Philomel, which we're gonna have a reading from, read by Alison Reed, um, uh, you, you will hear drama as, verse poetry so brilliantly. Tears can't help us, only the sword, or if it exists, something more pitiless even than the sword. Oh, my sister, 
Nothing now can soften the death Tereus is going to die. Let me see this palace, one flame, and Tereus a blazing insect in it, making it brighter. Let me break his jaw, hang him up by his tongue and saw it through with a broken knife, then dig his eyes from their holes. Give me the strength, you gods, to twist his hips and shoulders from their sockets and butcher the limbs off his trunk till his very soul, for terror, scatter away through a thousand exits. Let me kill him. Oh, however we kill him. Our revenge has to be something that will appall heaven and hell and stupefy the earth. While Procne raved, Itis came in. Mummy, mummy. Her heart ice. She saw what had to be done. Her fury seemed to be holding its breath for that moment as tears burned her eyes. She felt her love for this child softening her ferocious will. He tells me all his love, but she has no tongue to utter a word of hers. He can call me mother, but she cannot call me sister. This is the man you have married. Oh, daughter of Pandion, you are your father's shame and his despair. To love this monster, Tereus, or oh, pity him. You must be a monster. It is monstrous. How did Ted know you were doing this and did he, was he involved with the Tales from the Ovid. Absolutely, he knew um, we, we, myself and Simon Reed, who who was the dramaturgical colleague yeah. that I worked with. We uh, asked Ted's permission, asked him to be involved in 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 the script. We told him the way we wanted to do the script, and rather like David said about Iron Man right at the beginning, we didn't want any other text but Ted's text. We just wanted to take Ted's text and make it into drama. Um, and Ted was fine with that approach. So in this instance, we created the adaptation, not Ted, and yeah. sent it to Ted for his approval. By that stage, he was unfortunately pretty ill, yeah. and he gave it his full seal of approval as a project, but he passed before we got near rehearsal. Yeah. Can we finish uh, with the uh, <coughs> Oresteia, the trilogy, Aeschylus, which uh, was not performed uh, in his lifetime, um, but is, is as a sort of front runner for the greatest uh, uh, of his works, partly because it was one of the greatest plays. In many ways, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. first ever great play that we know about. He sent me that text before he sent it to the National just to say, you know, what do you think of this? And he put a little note. He said, I thought you'd be interested in my version of this little folk tale. <laughs> OK, and I thought that's brilliant, right? Uh, that's one a little bit so modest. Well, you know what? Little take way, the, the it, most the most titanic play in classical literature. Come on, it was having you on, wasn't it? No, I think he. I think in the end he saw both the brilliance of things, but when things were really brilliant, he saw them as as they are, which is manageable and uh, and not overblown. You know, um, he 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 saw that material as as refined um, earth matter, and it was quite handleable. And I think. That's the only other thing I was going to say. Reading, reading the work, he, the astonishing work he did on that, I think he filtered it so it, f so it, it comes through characters, situations. Uh, uh, the text of it comes through with 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 such refined clarity. That, that's just the simple thing. It's not, it, it's not explosive. It's not, uh, it's not um, in any way. Uh, Ornate, it, 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 it is absolutely its, it, itself in very pure 
glass-like clarity. Yeah, it's pure epic, isn't it? And it switches from one side to the other side, and there's another story comes in and replaces that story, and then as it goes on, more and more stories are revealed till you get to the root of the matter, you think. And you do, really, in the end, and the, the yeah. furies, and it's a fantastic piece of it. Well, is there anything else in genuine you'd like to say about Ted's poems? Well, I'd like to ask a question of my college and put an observation myself. Of course, when you said could we do with God? So of course, in, in The Iron Man, it's a very redemptive tale, isn't it? Very much, I would say, a tale for our time. It, does that quality of redemption a need to try to deal with the terrible things that these plays address exist in, in the plays through Ted's eyes, do you think? Or are we looking at well, the bleakness of... But there, yeah, but confronting terror isn't necessarily bleak. It's actually exhilarating. And I don't think there is a... Well, just going back to the Racine, there's a sort of... Uh, the, the thesis... Uh, adopts Arisi, this girl, this slave girl who... who um, but, and that's a sort of token. Oh, it's life goes on. But, but I don't think that... I don't think his... Just either blood wedding or spring awakening, or in certainly the, the, the Racine, I don't think it's despairing. It's a... It's, I think that's the nature of its... Of its cold-eyed, hard-eyed confrontation of, of the world of, as it and is. of the deeper world as it is. As it is, and actually, if you look back <laughs> on events of the last fortnight, you think exactly. wrong, is it? Yeah, right. yeah exactly. <laughs> and I think, I think just, just, just my, my last comment and in connected to that, for, 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 for me, the, the biggest homage I made to, to, to Ted um, for all the, that I, I learned from him about Shakespeare and about theatre and about poetry was a production I did of A Midsummer Night's Dream about six years after, after he died. And I did it in India. And, it, and, it, and I did it through a complete understanding gained through Ted to Ovid about this work. And it was like this word carnival. That I, I, don't think, I don't think in the end he was that interested in either redemption or bleakness. I think it is like, this is how it is. Yeah. And, Midsummer Night's Dream is the big, the big Ovid takeover, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. Yes. And in, in, the, in, the sort of, in, in the middle of Midsummer Night's Dream, you have the fairy queen, you have the spiritual high of our sense of beauty, and you have Bottom, the, 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 the character called Bottom, the very bottom of our earthly being. And in the marriage between the two, you have this fantastic carnival of, of, of human experience without judgment, without moral judgment. You bottom know. might be the very bottom of, uh, of our yeah, experience, yeah. but I'll have you know, I played that when I was 15 years old. This was one of the greatest, right. part, one of the greatest <laughs> parts in was, Unfortunately, they didn't record it. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd have loved to see you. And work. actually, because, of, <laughs> because I was called Bottom, it got more unnecessary laughs than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, David, Tim, Jonathan, thank you. and uh, there we are. Thank you.